Lucifer, Lord of Hell and Regent of the Damned. I'm a huge fan of Jordan Peterson. <coughs> right, we'll stop there. Um, reason I got this on is for, well, two reasons. One, today we are going to talk about Satan, right, amongst other things. We're going to the dark side. <coughs> uh, and two, um, so this is a video by a guy called Lance Thorn, <coughs> who's actually a Geordie. Uh, um, and there's a lot of this kind of sort of interesting content out on YouTube now where people are creating what you call video essays. This is a video essay. And myself <laughs> uh, and Dan uh, Kochi are going to be starting a sort of video essay discussion group uh, for students. Uh, at some point next week, uh, I don't have a time and date for it, but I will be sending it out. So anyone who's kind of interested in sort of maybe bringing examples of stuff that's actually out there online that you've watched and thought was interesting and worth talking about, um, yeah, look, for your e look, look at your email inboxes because we want to do a bit of that. Um, and because... It's not just interesting in terms of content, but also in terms of form, <coughs> right? Like, so Dan's speciality is sort of dramaturgy and theatre, and I have a bit of a film studies background, so we're really interested not just in like the content of the arguments, but the way in which people are now trying to make them through new media. So, if that's the sort of thing that sounds interesting to you, come along. All right. Um, we'll leave that there. Um, right. Uh, okay, so, um, <coughs> let's start. Um, so, like I was saying, uh, today we're going to go to the dark side, right? We are going to think about not simply the good or the beautiful, but also about the bad and the evil and the ugly. Right? So, uh, in the last lecture, I kind of structured everything around these three concepts so truth, um, beauty, and goodness. <coughs> We didn't really talk about the, the contrary to it, namely falsity, ugliness, and let's call it evil. Right? But this is itself already quite controversial. So what I want to kind of do, just to start off the lecture, this, again, this is the methodological bit where we talk about what questions we're interested in, is to talk a bit about, uh, about the language of value. <coughs> because as I said, these are, in, in some important sense, all value concepts. Right? These are all types of value. Right? So how do we talk about value? Uh, well, we talk about it in a variety of different ways, and often the difficulty is seeing how those different ways we talk line up. Um, so, for instance, um, we can talk about just good and bad, right? Good and bad. In a more kind of general sense, we don't always mean evil when we say bad, right? In fact, there's a certain sense in which... <laughs> This is kind of the more general way of thinking about value overall. Because we could sort of say, well, truth is good and falsity is bad. Beauty is good and ugliness is bad. Right? Good is sort of by definition good, and evil is less by definition bad. Right? So we've got like, there's a sense in which value is a kind of more general concept, and we've got some language for talking about it. But two other kinds of language we have here are better and worse, right? Right, 
this is what we might talk about as being kind of rather than absolute, this is relative. So, uh, how do I represent this in the board so everybody can see it? Uh, see, I'll just say, I'll just say this is relative. Right, that's the relative version of what looks like an absolute distinction here. Here, it's, it seems like we're saying things are either good or they're bad. Here, there's there's nuance, there's variation, right? The other kind of distinction um, is what we might call right and wrong, right? So, on the face of it, that looks like good and bad. That looks like either it's right or it's wrong, right? But what's different here is... <laughs> Rather than being relative <coughs> instead of absolute, it's, it's about actions rather than objects. So, you know, we can use the language of good <coughs> and bad to say, you know, like, I don't know, uh, um, I have potato masher that I really, really like because I think it's better than other potato mashers, but this is a good potato masher. Right. Simple, lovely, right? <coughs> but that's different from saying that. You know, when, uh, when a friend of mine went to help another friend by, you know, taking them food or just trying to provide them solace, solace, right? Saying that that was a good thing to do, right? You can, in a certain sense, use the same language of good and bad, but if we break down how we're using it, what we start to see is we're talking about kind of like right and wrong. We're talking about actions rather than objects, right? Now, again, this is just sort of clarifying the scope of the things we're trying to talk about, clarifying how we use the language of value. And why this is quite useful is because um, what, what we'll see with Augustine and the way in which he's developing on Plotinus is that he, he has a very particular way of configuring these three things, right? Which kind of identifies them, right? So for, for Augustine, sort of, um, beauty is good and good is beautiful, right? Um, and that's a very particular kind of philosophical position on the nature of these things that in some sense tries to explain how, um, how we use the language that we use. Um, so, is everybody okay with that? Any, again, if you've got a clarificatory question, always feel free to put your hand up. <coughs> right, big questions, we'll have to wait at the end. Um, so, okay, so we've got, again, two distinctions here, absolute relative. And object versus action. And again, the, the, the reason that this is interesting is when we talk about beauty, we tend to be talking about things in a relative way. It's like things as being more or less beautiful, right? But we, t we tend to be talking about objects rather than actions, right? And when we're talking about goodness in the sense of goodness versus evil, we tend to be talking in absolute terms, but we're talking in absolute terms about action, right? Um, and if you don't distinguish these different ways of talking about value, what you end up with is weird kinds of conflation. So one, one thing, <coughs> okay, software update, uh, one thing that it's easy to fall into, if you don't see what's going on here, is you will just call value the good, all right? And so this, like, you end up with like two different senses of good, like a wide one and a narrow <coughs> one. A, a wide one, which is just value as such, and a narrow one that is kind of value in a very particular way regarding the actions we perform in the world. <coughs> the topic of ethics. <coughs> Right. And there is an important relationship here, and there's a philosophical question about how these things relate to one another. Like I said, for, 
For Plato, he thinks goodness is primary precisely because it enables you to understand the other two. Because the attitudes that you're supposed to take to these things, like thinking and loving, are things you do. Right? But again, not everybody is going to agree with Plato. Right. Um, one sort of final methodological distinction that I want to make before we move on to the history and the theology. So I've, I've already said here that um, that what what's going on here is a sort of need to explain the the way we talk about things within the world and our actions within it. We make all these evaluative judgments. And this is what, what philosophers and theologians are trying to do, is to sort of explain this. But there's an important distinction between... So, let's put it a different way. Everybody wants to ask the question, why? Right? Why is this good? Why is this bad? Why is this ugly? Right? Why is this wrong? Right? Why is this better? Why is this worse? But there's two kinds of questions you can ask here. One is to ask for a sort of explanation. How did this state of affairs come to be, and why is it that this kind of state of affairs is, has this particular kind of value? But you, you might also be interested in justification. <coughs> and justification is much more about, it's less about causes than it is about um, reasons in the sense of responsibility. So the easiest way to articulate this is to give you a really silly example, which I'm going to keep coming back to. So if I go to a restaurant, right, and I order some food, and my food turns up ice cold, right, and it's supposed to be hot, but it just turns up, like it's frozen in the middle or whatever, right, the two kinds of questions I sort of want to ask there, one is like, how did this come to pass? Like, what had to fail in the kitchen in order for this to happen? Right? And the second question might be, whose fault is it? Like, is this just a, a, a kind of random accident because an oven failed? Like, that nobody can read, nobody's really responsible for it. Or is it like, is there a chef who deliberately sent this through the pass knowing it was bad? Right? You know, and thus has done something wrong. Right? Um, those are two different kinds of why <laughs> questions. And what we're talking about here in this lecture is theodicy. <coughs> which is the way in which theologians try and justify the existence of suffering in the world. Right? <coughs> and more generally, this is what we kind of call the problem of evil. <coughs> So what this problem is, and you'll, you'll probably have come across it in certain ways, is, is that we take God to have sort of three central properties, right? So God, God's sort of nature is given by omnipotence, which is a certain kind of power, omniscience. knowledge and benevolence which is goodness right again sort of well anyway uh, and the third thing that has to be explained is there is evil. Right? There is evil in the world. So if, if we're going to make our conception of God and our conception of the world compatible, <coughs> we need to somehow explain these three things. Right? Because there are things in the world like starving children. Right? And it's reasonable to ask, how could 
an all-powerful, all-knowing, an all-good God allow something like that to happen? And the answer to that question is the Odyssey. Now, to, again, turn back to my sort of stupid, simple <coughs> example, right? What I want to do in the case where my food turns up ice cold is speak to the manager, right? Like, I want to speak to your manager. I want to find out what's going on here and if there's somebody at fault, right? The Odyssey <coughs> is the response to the question, I want to see the manager for the entire universe, right? Like, I want to speak to your supervisor, and eventually get to the upper top line where there's no <coughs> nobody else behind them, and that's God. Right. Okay. Right. So that's the methodological bit out the way. Um, now we're going to turn to the historical and theological stuff. Can everybody read just about what I'm writing on the board? Uh, cool. I'm trying to stay within within the distance of the mic, uh, so all this all gets recorded. Um, so, um, I think that if you look at religions, you tend to see that they have two distinct creation myths. They need to have two different uh, cr accounts of creation. On the one hand, they need an account of the creation of the world, And on the other, they need an account of the creation of humanity. And what's interesting about this <coughs> is that you can kind of see the, the creation, the story about the creation of the world as being about what you might think of as the, the cosmic order. Like they see the, the entire world as being a kind of machine with all of its separate parts that are doing all of the different jobs. Right? <coughs> Everything is in a kind of cosmic harmony, right? And inevitably, the creation of humanity is a kind of break in that order. Like, humans aren't like other animals. They aren't like anything else, right? And that needs to be explained. Crucially, because they can violate the natural order, right? Like, the natural order says that humans should only behave in certain ways, but once humans know they should only behave in certain ways, they can act in the exact opposite way, right? Um, uh, and what this does <coughs> is it's... It articulates some kind of story about the notion of free will, the notion of evil, and the specific kind of evil uh, of humanity, which is <coughs> right. Evil can just be anything in the world. Evil can just be an object, right? You know. Uh, evil can just be, like, I don't know, the existence of pot noodles, that's an example. Right. Maybe, I'm not, you know, you know but, but sin is the actions. Sin is the things we choose to do, right? <coughs> not simply uh, sort of abstract stuff. Um, how are we doing time? All right. So, how does this work with a given creation myth? Right? I want to just very quickly discriminate between the sort of Greek conception of, of humanity, which is the sort of Prometheus myth, and uh, the Christian, which is <coughs> the fall, right? So for the Greeks, uh, you know, uh, Prometheus was in charge of, well, and his brother, Epimetheus, were in charge of handing out all the talents to the different animals. So, you know, birds get to fly, wolves get to have sharp claws and teeth, and 
each animal gets its own particular thing, gets its own place in the natural order. And when he gets to humans, there's nothing left. Sorry, all out of towns. Right? And so what Prometheus does is he steals fire from the gods and gives it to humanity. And symbolically, this is technology, right? Humans don't have a natural place in their environment, but they can make their own environments. They can change their environments, right? Because they have this power of technology. And this is the kind of break with the natural order. But of course, that break then gets, uh, in a certain sense, repaired or reconciled because Prometheus gets punished, right? And we're told, don't break too far. Right, you know, the gods, we've given, we, we've allowed you to be certain sort of special, but you still have to have your own particular role with the natural order, right, and you shouldn't transgress against it. Um, uh, so, interestingly enough, this is, this is a conception of humanity as being special because, in a certain sense, we lack something, right, it's a negative pers perspective on the nature of humanity. Um, whereas in the Christian myth, you know, Adam and Eve are made special from the get-go, right? They're, they're given a, a, a positive quality, which is to say they resemble God, right? Humankind resembles the divine more than anything else, right? But then a snake comes into the garden and persuades them to do the one thing they've been told not to do, right? Which is to eat from the tree of knowledge. And on the basis of that knowledge, they know what is good and bad. Previously, this was the only sin they could commit. Once they've eaten the apple, they know about all the possible sins that they can commit. Right? Um, and again, suddenly, free will and sin become possible. Right? This is, this is the original sin from which other sins um, Evolve, right? So, again, original sin. Something we're going to be talking about more. Um, so, again, there's, got to, there's this kind of rupture in the natural order that has to then be healed. And the Christian story about that healing is Christ. Right? Why Jesus is significant is because God comes down in the form of a man and takes the entire sins of the world upon himself and then is sacrificed, right? And through that, through coming into the communion of the Christian church, you can absolve yourself of sin, right? You can absolve yourself of original sin and be reconciled with the natural order. Um, cool. Um, it's also worth talking a little bit more about evil in general, and I'd like to contrast these stories I've told with some other creation myths, not specifically about humanity, but about the world in general. So last time we talked a little bit about Gnosticism. Oh, was that a hand? Cool. Uh, people were interested in Gnosticism, so I just want to kind of... So if you want to look at something that's pre-Christian, which is very important, you can look at Zoroastrianism, which used to be like the biggest religion in, in sort of uh, Persia and parts of the Middle East. Um, and in Zoro Zoroastrianism, um, there are two like competing forces right, in the world, one of good and one of evil. There's Ahura Mazda, the lord of, of, of good, and then there's Araman, the lord of evil. Right? And so the, the, the na nature of reality <coughs> is this kind of constant war between good and evil. Um, uh, and how you think about that depends on which branch of Zoroastrianism you fall, you come down, but it's, it's interesting, right? Then we get Christianity, right, which we're all sort of familiar with. And Christianity does have this kind of conflict. But the conflict in Christianity is between God and the devil, or Satan, or Lucifer, however you prefer to talk about it, right? And again, you need a story about how this conflict is supposed to go. And the story in Christianity is actually 
that the fall of man is actually the second fall, because the first fall is the fall of Lucifer. You know, he's just an angel, and then he rejects God and God's plan. You know, he <coughs> rather rule in hell than serve in heaven. Um, and you know, if you're interested in the metaphysics of good and evil, you you and you're a theologian in the first few centuries after Christ, you need to be able to tell a story about this. And you're probably not going to want it to be the same sort of story as Erastianism. You want Lucifer to be perpetually subservient to God. You want Lucifer to be part of the plan rather than uh, something independent of it. Right? Then what happens with Gnosticism is Gnosticism really is a bunch of different faiths that kind of come after Christianity. Some of them variants of Christianity, some of them a bit weirder, right? Um, and the two that I want to mention briefly are uh, Manichaeanism right? And this is whenever we use the word uh, Manichaean, that kind of indicates this idea of like a, an absolute battle between good and evil. <coughs> And this is the this is the religion that Augustine joined before he became Christian. So Augustine was a Manichaean who then read Plotinus, and somehow Plotinus convinced him that Christianity was the right religion. And then what he had to do was explain that to everyone else, and that's why we get the Confessions. Right? The Confessions is the story of his his coming to Christianity. <laughs> the other one that is kind of worth mentioning is called Mandeanism. <laughs> Uh, which still exists in parts of Iraq uh, and Iran. Um, it's really fascinating religion, and this is very clearly Gnostic. Um, the Mandeans worship the snake, right? Because from their perspective, Eden is not paradise. Eden is a trap. Right? Eden is the trap that um, the demiurge, the evil god, Right, has trapped the souls, the spirits of mankind in. Right? It's the material world, and we've been trapped by it. And the snake brings wisdom. The snake brings gnosis, right? the knowledge we need to escape. So eating from the knowledge, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is the, the moment of liberation. <coughs> right? And the rest of the kind of journey after that is acquiring the rest of the knowledge we need to free ourselves from the material world. Right. So almost a complete flip of the Christian story we're familiar with. So yeah, there are some, those are some Gnostic faiths. Read up on them on Wikipedia, they're really fascinating. Um, okay, now to the actual theology. Right. So let's actually talk about Augustine. I've already mentioned how the problem of evil works and what theodicy is. So let me let me talk about the theodicies that are available because there, there are kind of genres of theodicy. Um, so before Augustine <coughs> we have Irenaeus. Uh, I think I'm spelling that right. Uh, who um, who is sort of second century, Augustine's more fourth century, and Irenaeus's view was that the reason there is suffering in the world is that it makes us better. Like, without adversity, we could not become the, the sorts of souls that God wants us to be. Right? Like, there needs to be struggle. Right? Um, and this is very popular for some people. Other people will then go... But yeah, that starving child, right? Like, that starving child who's dying, like, that's maybe unfair amounts of adversity. Like, that's not going to make them better. They're just going to die, right? Uh, so that's an interesting sort of back and forth. So there it's about sort of adversity and growth, right? Uh, Augustine gives us a very different theodicy, right? Um... Um, which is, so in fact, this is a better way to put it. Um, if Irenaeus tells us that 
basically the reason there is suffering is because we need to cultivate freedom. Like, you know, God, God gives you free will, but it needs to be cultivated to become like a proper free agent. <coughs> yeah, uh, I think so. Soul making, yeah. Um, so this is cultivating your soul, right? Uh, for Augustine, it's about achieving grace. You know, through the grace of God, you are lifted up. And this brings us back to um, to Plotinus, actually. <laughs> but I think the, the 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 one thing I want to say before looking at that is um, that basically, you know, I said salvation is the most important concept in Christianity. Like what Augustine actually does is not just to give us a theodicy, but to give us a theory of salvation, right? So freedom from suffering, eternal life, is conditional upon freedom from guilt, right? Which is to say the forgiveness of sin, right? That's the compact that Augustine lays out. If you, you know, take Jesus into your heart and apologize for your sins, you will get eternal life. You will get the kingdom of heaven. Um, so let's look at Augustine. Um, <coughs> yeah, okay. So I, I put down two sort of fragments for you to read. I apologize if the numbering was a little bit confusing. <coughs> Um, I'll try not to do that in future um, but the two fragments are, are sort of book two and book seven of the confessions so what happens in, in book two um, well uh, here's my take um, Augustine begins by talking about this example of stealing pears right you know him and some mates just stealing some pears and then throwing them at the pig. And he makes a big deal of the fact that, like, really he wasn't interested in the pears. Like, really what he was interested in was the sin. Like, he wanted to sin, right? So what he's interested in is, like, sin for its own sake. <coughs> and again, this is what Augustine and the, Christi and the sort of Christian myth tells us is unique to humans. Like, pigs can't sin, right? Pigs are just part of the natural order. They can't rebel against it. We, once we're aware of the natural order, we can deliberately decide to violate it, right? And that's crucially tied to the possibility of free will. This is like the nature of free will. Like, the ability to sin, right? Um, then he kind of gives an account to some extent of what this is, or what he, what he takes this to be, which is kind of pride. Like pride is a sort of primal sin here because you, know, you, you, you resent having anyone telling you what to do, so you want to lift yourself up to be equal to God. Right? And so you say, no, nah, not having any of it, you can't do it. You, you can't make me do it, Dad. You know, like, this is the sort of like rebellion against the father figure, but the cosmic father figure. Um, interestingly enough, that's also Satan. Right? Satan is the ultimate figure of like individual rebellion against authority. And Satan's like Satan basically just is pure pride. Right? A refusal to subordinate himself to anything. Right? Even God. And so he chooses sin for its own sake. Chooses hell. Better to, um, better to rule in hell than to serve in hell. Um, the other thing we get here is ultimately an account of original sin. Like what it actually is about the fall that makes us sin for its own sake. That turns us away from God. Right? <coughs> And um, basically, it's separation, <coughs> right? Original sin is separation from God, right? And to achieve grace, 
is to turn back towards God and to ascend. Right. And this is where you can start to see why Plotinus was so important for Augustine. Right? Because Plotinus has this like literal metaphysics of the one, which is God, and then all of the layers of reality through which things emanate. Right? Down at the bottom there's pure matter, there's worms, there's whatever the worst things are taken to be, and the better things are closer to God. Right? And we are unique in that we have the possibility of being far away and then also turning back through Christ having the possibility of achieving grace, right, of becoming more like God. Um, and again, Christ is the promise of this because Christ is God in human form. Right? That's the ideal to which we aspire. Cool. Um, what's going on in book seven then? Uh, I'm going to have to speed up here. Um, well, I've already talked to you about Plotinus, all right? But let's say something slightly more interesting. So I've used the word being before, right? And in a certain sense, this is just whatever anything has. Thing that is common to everything that is created by God. Right? That has being, that has being, I have being, sun, sky, everything is. Right? Now, what Augustine does is to say that being is goodness. He has an argument for this that we'll look at in seminars. It's a bit weird, but it's interesting. Right? He basically thinks that. There can't be anything that has no good. To have no good is to not exist. Right? So this is the hierarchy of being. God has the most being, and then everything else has less being in relation to how far away from God it is. Right? Um, now, uh, what he also <coughs> then says is, and we've got sort of two accounts of creation here. So, if you think that what it is to be is to be good, then what it is for everything, the whole of the world, <coughs> to be, to be created by God, is to be beautiful. Right. Or, using putting it in the terms that Augustine gives us, or that Plotinus gives Augustine, to be harmonious. Right. All of the parts of the cosmos <coughs> fit together right, in such a way that even though individual parts of them might look, like if you look up close, might look not so good, they all fit within the plan. Right. So again, this is the natural order, and the natural order conceived as beauty. Right. Um, and on the other hand, creation is also seen as true. <coughs> like, everything that is, everything that is, is everything that is true. <coughs> like, God creates the world through determining what is true. And this is how Augustine distinguishes his view of God coming from Papinus from what you might call pantheism. So some people will say the divine just is everything. God is everywhere and in everything. And that's not Augustine's view. Augustine's view is that, is that everything emanates out from God. Right? Um, like God is independent and pure and simple and cannot be identified with everything, even though he is, in a certain sense, reflected in everything. Right. There's another interesting term here that we might talk about at some later point, which is the transcendentals. And the transcendentals are those properties that all things have simply insofar as they have being. And these will be things like 
goodness, truth, and unity. Right. Again, the one is the most unified, but everything that is has to itself be unified in some way. Because it is. That's what it is to be. Right. Um, where does this go then? Well, crucially, and this is the, the punchline of the whole Augustinian story, is that what evil is, evil is privation. Or another way to put that is to say evil is nothing. Right? Evil is not a positive substance in the world. Evil is only the absence of good. Right? And precisely in so far as everything is, emanates out of God but becomes less like God as you go further out, things become more evil, more ugly. Right? Just because they aren't perfect. They aren't God. Sorry. Every, like, in essence, evil is just <coughs> the unlikeness, like dissimilarity <coughs> in God. Right? And if you want to be more like God, we need to <coughs> ascend, we need to recognize goodness and go in the opposite direction. <coughs> and this is um, a theodicy because, in essence, what it enables Augustine to say is that God is not responsible for evil. If you're evil, that's your business. <coughs> right? Like God hasn't created evil because evil cannot be created. Like only good can be created. <coughs> right? So God is not responsible for sin or for the evil in the world. Right? This actually means that Augustine has to take quite an interesting position on Satan. Because he also has to say that, in a certain sense, like Satan could achieve grace if he wanted. If Satan wanted to to will to be better, he could also <coughs> the arms of the Lord. Right? It's not beyond him. It's just that he's too prideful and willful to ever do so. Okay, right. Um, now, that's the story about Augustine. We will talk about the text in more detail in seminars. And we'll try and look at some of the arguments. What I've given you is the narrative. But the arguments Augustine has are kind of interesting. But what I want to do is to now do the philosophy bit. Like the, what happens after theology and how does it inherit from here. So, um, can everybody see this bit of the board? Can I nick this bit of the board? So, um, the key thing here is... Um, what gets called modern philosophy is normally seen as being the break with theology. <coughs> right, and it's so I've, the, the way we're structuring the course is we're doing, we're doing Augustine, who's kind of Platonic theology, and then we're, doing, we're going to eventually sort of end at Aquinas, so we sort of Aristotelian theology. And then what happens after Aquinas, and well, a couple hundred years later, is we get Descartes. Spinoza and Leibniz, and these are the, the sort of rationalists. But the thing is, is these guys are a lot less discontinuous with what comes before than we tend to realise. Like, in many ways, Descartes was just replaying Augustine. Right? The Meditations is just like the Confessions. Right? Um, so Descartes was kind of a platonic rebel against the Aristotelian. Uh, hegemony at the time. And something similar can be said for Spinoza and Leibniz, right? And they all provide a new conception of God. And they all do it by reconfiguring how we think about power, knowledge, and goodness. They each say we need to think about power, knowledge, and goodness differently. And on that basis, give their own theodicy. Um... So for, for, for Descartes, um, God is so powerful that he can make contradictions true. Right? God can make 2 plus 2 equals 5 if he wants to. That's how powerful God is. But he chooses not to. He's not an evil demon, right? because he's benevolent. Uh, for Spinoza, um, the whole sense in which uh, knowledge 
God has knowledge <laughs> becomes totally different. God ends up being pure knowledge in a certain sense, right? And this is power, right? Knowledge is power. God is knowledge. God is power. Absolute power. Um, but the person I want to talk about is, is Leibniz, because <coughs> this is the extra reading I've said. So one, one final point here. Another way of, 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 <coughs> of asking the question of modern philosophy from this perspective is, how is God free? Like, we, we understand that we're free in some sense. What does it mean for God to be free? Right? And you get very different answers from these three different thinkers. Um, the, the answer I want to look at, though, is Leibniz. And again, I've, I've set the Leibniz's optional reading. It's really good to read because it's, it's pure arguments. He gives all the arguments very, very explicitly. But what Leibniz basically does is to say that, um, well, what he does is to kind of redefine benevolence. He says that benevolence is about the best, right? So God wishes us the best. God puts us in the best possible world. And if we see evil within that world, that's just because we don't understand that it, it's the condition of having the best possible world. Right? You can't have the best world unless you know, there are a few earthquakes. Right? You can't have the best possible world unless you have um, some other weird things happening. And I think the best way to explain this is to say that if you think about stories, right, these are sort of like possible worlds. You read fiction, like alt histories, right, and they're like an alternate possible world, right? So Leibniz had a way of thinking about this and thinking about why the world we're in is unique. And you might say that in stories, you know, think they can be incomplete, right? They can lack details. Like, does Harry Potter have a secret half sister? We don't know. Don't know. Just not part of the story, right? But they can also be inconsistent, right? Like, like why are why are there poor wizards? <laughs> like, why why do these people with magic power live in poverty of various kinds? Like, surely. They can just kind of make all and sell it on the market, and we find, right? You know, maybe that's a terrible example, but it's what I'm going with. <coughs> Leibniz thinks that we live in the best possible world because it's the most complete and consistent world there can be. And the way he will put this is he'll say it's the most continuous. Right? There are no gaps in reality, right? And there are no contradictions, right? We live in the most detailed possible world, the richest world that there can be. Right. So, um, um, right, what does this mean? Um, I want to close by talking about politics. Um, because... When you learn about theology, what you start to see is that the way in which theodicies justify suffering, on the absolute scale, get reflected at the level of power and the state. Right? So, you know, like, I want to see your manager, right? It, you know, we, we can't get all the way to God, but sometimes we can get to the Prime Minister, right? And ask him, look, why are things the way they are? And so if we look at austerity, which has been going on for like 10 years, right? There's a reason for the suffering there. Austerity is kind of claimed to be a reason. And we can ask, we can ask for an explanation, we can ask for the causal stuff, like financial crisis, stuff like this. But we can also ask for justification, like why were these particular policies implemented? And so I want to just pick one example, which is DWP assessments. So, you know, assessing people who are disabled to see if you know, they actually deserve their benefits or so whether they should be forced to work. <coughs> So on the one hand, one answer that gets given here is work is good for the soul. Like, work is good for you. That's erroneous. Right? Um, on the other hand, you might get an answer which is, look, the negative bits of work, the bad bits, the stress and the tiring and all that sort of stuff, that's just, like, the absence of the good bits. Like, that's not really part of what work is. Right? 
Another way of putting that might be to say that poverty is just the absence of work. Right? What you need is more work, right? not better work. Finally, someone might just say, this is the best possible system. Right? I know there's bad bits, but like, this is just the best we can get. That's Leibniz. Right? You have Irenaeus, Augustine, Leibniz reflected at the level of contemporary politics. Right, the theology is always sitting there in the background. And if you learn about it, you can see it. Right, uh, that's that. Uh, any final questions? <laughs>